This week on Africa Update. Hundreds march across cities in Kenya, South Africa, Senegal and Tunisia in protest over rising cost of living and perceived political injustice. We examine government's reaction to agitations and dissenting voices. Also on the program, activists embark on 862-kilometer walk to advocate for a federation between Mali and Burkina Faso. Welcome to the program. I am Ayuba Ilya, reaching you from Abuja, Nigeria's capital. From the north to south, east to west of the African continent, four countries, namely Tunisia, South Africa, Kenya and Senegal, citizens have taken to the streets to protest rising inflation and what they consider political injustice. Led by opposition leaders, they took to the streets calling out their respective presidents in action to address economic and political hurdles bedeviling their countries. Julius Malema, the leader of the South Africa's Economic Freedom Fighters Party, led citizens in various cities to push for President Cyril Ramaphosa's resignation following an endless circle of economic crisis facing the country. Down with load shedding, down! Down with unemployment, down! Down with unemployment, down! Puma Ramaphosa, Puma! Puma Ramaphosa, Puma! Today, there is no big mall, there is no small mall, no shop, no factory, no school, no nothing is open today. All of them are closed. Kenya's opposition leader Raila Odinga, who lost in the last general elections, led demonstrations against what he deemed a deliberate increase in the cost of living caused by new taxes and inability to control inflation. Odinga still claims he won the presidential race last August, maintaining that he will never acknowledge Ruto as a legitimate president. He also announced a continuous weekly protest every Monday to demand resignation of President William Ruto. Hello! Hello! Vijana! Madam Gogo! Governor Wanga! In a similar vein, thousands of supporters of Senegalese opposition leader Osman Sonko rallied in Dakar as the country prepares for elections in less than a year. Sonko is being accused of defamation, rape and sending death threats to an employee at a beauty salon. Accusations his supporters believe are politically motivated to scuttle his chances of standing for elections. Tensions are rising ahead of the vote in a country seen as a democratic mainstay in the region amid speculation that President Macky Sall could bypass the constitution and seek a third presidential term. Also, thousands of Tunisians rallied in the streets of the capital, Tunis, protesting President Kai Said's perceived autocratic rule. They want Said to resign for orchestrating what they feel was a coup last July, pushing for unpopular constitutional amendments. They accuse him of cracking down on dissenting politicians, labor union figures, judges, a prominent businessman and the head of an independent radio station. I am 63 years old. I came today because I am a patriot. My country is a red line. Tunisia is a red line. Foreigners should not interfere in our politics or our country. I do not want anyone to interfere. 
We could have been a great country, but they made us poor. They let us eat from the rubbish, to eat stale bread. What did they do the past 10 years? Now, joining me for more perspectives on this is Philip Pande, a policy analyst who joins me from Kisumu uh, in Kenya. Thank you so much uh, for joining uh, Philip on Africa Update today. Hey, thanks. Uh, I, once again, it's a pleasure to join you from the most strategic city in the East African community, Kisumu. Um, it is a pleasure to talk to the people of Africa on Africa Update. All right. Thank you so much. Well, you are in Kisumu, one of the hotbeds, I may say, in Kenya where this protest uh, took place. Could you paint us a picture uh, of what exactly happened in, in Kisumu? Very well, uh, Ayub. Uh, Kisumu is traditionally... Um, the hotbed of, of protest or civil disobedience in, in Kenya, as it were, uh, that is um, second to none. Um, I, I believe that even the, the national capital, uh, Nairobi, borrows a lot from practices from Kisumu. So what was uh, here last Monday um, were organized onset at 6 a.m. when uh, the masses who are reporting into the cities, I mean, the, the streets. Uh, initially, we didn't see much of uh, a police uh, presence even uh, in the last three days before the main protest. Um, um, just to take you back, Ayub, uh, before the Monday protest on the 20th, there were uh, what we could call rehearsals, uh, at least three days before the main uh, event. And uh, in those events, um, the masses walked towards the State House, uh, State, House, State Lodge uh, Road, which is um, in Kisumu, the, the, the uh, third city in, in Kenya. And um, in, in those events, the police were calm, the public uh, was calm, and um, you know, it was by consensus that uh, they needed to um, not to get to the state lodger gates, um, which they uh, the public had intended to go to. So there was no police confrontation initially. But on the 20th of, of March, then uh, what began uh, immediately, the people began showing up in, in the streets who were um, dispersed by the police, um, a shooting in the um, dispersed uh, dispersion by um, means of tear gas and 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 you know police force for that matter. So uh, much of the protests that were planned did not take place as were planned because the police interrupted. Okay, so uh, what's the what's at the heart of this protest? It is uh, from what we understand, it's about the rising cost of living, isn't it? Uh, don't you think that we are creating more problems uh, by aiming to solve one? Because uh, if there's a rising cost of living, now going to protests leading to shutting down of businesses. That in itself is a problem, isn't it? I have my unbiased opinion. Cost of living is, is, is a reality, not just in Kenya, but across many economies now. We have seen... Um, such a regime that is not responsive to the calls of, of the public. For example, on Monday, this week on the on the dailies, one of the local dailies, the uh, the front page had uh, a, a, a story about 802 million Kenya shillings. That's an equivalent of about um, um, eight eight million dollars that was intended to purchase is motor vehicle for the office of the president, that's the deputy president of the president, and the office of the prime uh, cabinet secretary. So basically three uh, top government officials accumulating uh, or consuming $8 million in uh, purchase of uh, motor vehicle, while uh, uh, the public, for example, is uh, asking for subsidies for maize flour, for fuel, for uh, uh, fast-moving commodities that uh, make 
uh, daily uh, uh, meals for wananchi or of the citizens in this part of the country. So um, yes, um, we could say that there is a cost of living, ramp, uh, uh, you know, denting uh, many economies, uh, inflation going up. Uh, global recession predicted at 1% for this uh, particular uh, fiscal year. But then what are the actions taken by the government? What is um, um, endangering the lives of, of, of people? And what is the opposition reading as malice in terms of uh, actions by the government? So the inaction by, by government of, of curiosity, a lot of animosity, on the part of the opposition and those who subscribe to the general feeling that uh, there is a heightened cost of living, but there is no um, stopgap measure or there is no uh, safety net for those who are suffering at this particular moment. Okay. Um, uh, Philip, to be fair, isn't it too early for Kenyans to begin to expect any change from this government, given the fact that the issue of inflation, this global inflation started as far as uh, maybe two years ago with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and so uh, he is barely six months into office. So isn't it too early? I, time is of essence. And uh, if, if you ask me, I would, I would be fair to say that, yes, we, we needed to be more patient with the... Uh, uh, you know, new administrations and uh, people coming into office, especially after the dance of, of COVID-19. Um, we needed to be more patient uh, with administrations coming into office, especially after the, uh, the Russia-Ukrainian uh, in invasion. We needed to be more patient with new administrations that are facing, um, you know, the global recession in 2023. But there is a peculiar shift in, in policy in Kenya, for, for instance. Uh, in the last administration of uh, President Uhuru uh, Kenyatta, there were stopgap measures, safety nets that were installed by the very administration to safeguard uh, the public. One of them was um, a maize flour subsidy that ensured that uh, maize still retailed at the correct prices for the public to afford. The other one was a fuel subsidy that also ensured that uh, at pump prices were still affordable per liter for uh, motorists and, and, and for consumption for industrial use. But then immediately the new regime came in. Uh, the initial things that they did were to, for example, uh, do away with the subsidies both for fuel and, and the maize flour. Uh, they did away with uh, um, a number of... Uh, uh, what was seen to be, uh, you know, um, safety nets for uh, cautioning the public from, you know, deeper pains and, and afflictions that were occurring due to uh, the denting economic times. Okay. So Kenyans are not particularly responding to the fact that uh, the regime is only seven months old but has not had time. The regime had had time but has shifted policy, has shifted focus from cautioning um, uh, poor Kenyans by revising policy and ensuring that uh, those that uh, were places of comfort are now, uh, you know, uh, removed and, and, and people are facing life head on. People okay. are facing uh, uh, the bare knuckles of uh, economic downturns. Okay, Philip, I'm imagining that the government will make the case that the policies you just mentioned are not reaching the very people it was meant for. So perhaps they could make the argument of corruption and you know, not being able to achieve the desired results that these policies were meant for. <laughs> I, I, um, that's um, a, a fair argument. Um, if you ask policy and fiscal analysts in Kenya, for example, they'll tell you that uh, in seven months alone of uh, President William Ruto's regime, the the um, office of the president has spent more than the president uh, in the previous regime was spending in, in 12 months. Uh, the state house and, and office of the president budget has gone, uh, you know, fourfold, uh, which means that um, at the executive level, people are enjoying the little resources that we, we, we keep talking about 
uh, the limited uh, uh, exchequer that uh, wananchi or the public are not uh, experiencing or enjoying at all. So it would be um, a, a small cake uh, to call it, but the small cake not uh, divided among anyone else other than the executive. Um, the other thing I, that I would mention is um, in terms of taxation, there have been a lot of adjustments in our tax uh, uh, regimes. Uh, for example, um, in another looming uh, tax on, on second-hand clothes is that, um, you know, tax per, per, per kilo of, of, of uh, second-hand clothes imported is going to go up by, you know, four times more than the initial um, spending by traders in, in that aspect. The, this very new regime has introduced, you know, extra uh, um, regimes on, on, uh, on, on, on our taxes, for example, on, on, on various aspects of, of uh, raw materials, on various aspects of, uh, of uh, shifting from, um, you know, retailers being able to enjoy a more conducive uh, tax environment, wholesalers being okay. able to bring in goods. And, you know, there have been particular attacks on, on enterprises. And, and just recently, I had, um, you know, an article featured in one of the dailies warning against um, rampant shift on policies that then begin to target uh, SMEs that are foreign-led or businesses that are uh, Asian-led okay, or South-led that has public policy implications on, on the uh, geopolitics uh, uh, scales and, right. and global aspects. Okay, you know, Philip, let's take a much more uh, maybe holistic view now of this. This protest is not only happening in Kenya, it's happening in South Africa, where we see the opposition leader, Julius Malema, leader of the EFF, talk about, you know, jobs, uh, high rate of unemployment. He talks about, uh, you know, the, uh, cut in terms of uh, supply of electricity. Uh, so that's a myriad of uh, challenges there. In, in, in Kenya, we hear Raila Odinga talk about the claims that he won the elections. Don't you think that the opposition is taking advantage of some of these economic crises and latching on it? I, there is no separation between politics and economics. Polity determines what happens in terms of economic uh, policies, um, um, you know, cultural diversities, and even the social uh, space for uh, political actors, for the civil society, and many others. So politics is the mother of all other aspects uh, to life in, in, in any given economy or, uh, uh, you know, civilization. Um, in, in South Africa, in, in Kenya here, in, um, in uh, Senegal, in, um, in Tunisia, the issues are the same, just like you, you mentioned. There is a convergence on one, uh, political uh, reforms, and then secondly, on economic issues, and peculiarly um, targeted uh, um, uh, economic policies, that are shifting from responding to the real issues that uh, you know citizens across these nations um, are talking about. South Africa, for example, has experienced a downturn uh, in terms of economic uh, growth for the last uh, period of, uh, I could say, two years uh, in, in the regime of, uh, of President uh, Ramaphosa. And in, in Tunisia, the situation is, is, is more uh, elevated um, looking at the facts that the opposition, for example, the National Salvation Front is uh, is talking about. So I wouldn't say that uh, opposition leaders are taking advantage of, uh, of economics to uh, play politics. I, uh, I, if you go back to the history of the Arab Spring, the issues were the same, the goals were the same, uh, talking about reforms, talking about inclusion, talking about employment, talking about creation of a fair platform for all citizens. And, you know, uh, those um, revelations on uh, revolutions uh, that occurred 10 years now have shaped the, um, the future of African politics or global politics for that matter. That citizens and opposition leaders, civil society movements, religious institutions 
okay. and formations that do not agree with the economic policy uh, policies can then march and 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 dictate what they they want to feel like All what right. they want to uh, be subjected to okay uh, philip let's talk about local solutions uh, in a, in a minute or two if you can uh, what local solutions are available to us, considering the fact that these are global challenges? The issue of inflation is a global challenge. We talk more about how much the Russia-Ukraine war has impacted on our economy, even in mm -hmm. Africa. You know, the same with the issue of COVID-19 pandemic and the rest of them. Local solutions. How much focus are we giving to that? I uh, firstly. The dance of COVID are still with us. The economic uh, uh, effects of COVID were, were not sufficiently addressed uh, in 2021, 2022, and even today in fiscal budgets uh, across all, all civilizations. And so really we require advisory offices um, uh, economic offices for our presidencies and, and our economies to be very peculiar and specific with addressing uh, underlying issues that then has led to overprojection or building budgets on, 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 on sands rather than on solid ground. The other thing immediately is that we know that we're experiencing an, um, you know, heightened inflation, even in Europe, even in, in, in UK. Uh, it was predicted by a this year then that UK would have the highest level of inflation in unprecedented levels before, uh, than before. So one thing that governments must do is to have immediate safety nets that safeguard um, the issues now. It's, it's action now and things need to be done and corrected now. Uh, for example, in Kenya, we have uh, the, the, the regime talking about, you know, fertilizer subsidy that is coming to effect in, in six months. I mean, the production would only help Kenyans in six months. But before six months, then, you know, people are sitting tight. As they sit tight, they have to afford the daily bread. So what helps nations and citizens to secure daily bread? Just yes, as it are like it were in, in the COVID times, many economies um, uh, compressed development funding. Yes, development is important. Infrastructure uh, funding is important, but at at core is the spending on 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 what makes life sustainable, what makes life livable today and in the future. So let's have uh, stopgap measures that deal with uh, the urgency of now. Let's have. Um, you know, medium term plans like the ones that we are hearing about uh, in Kenya, and I, I know other economies are trying to implement that. And then let's have uh, posterity measures. So immediately, okay. it is the agency of now for every economy. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Philip Pandey, uh, policy analyst and governance analyst joining us. Thank you for your perspectives on Africa update. Many thanks. I, once again, it's a pleasure talking to you on pertinent issues that affect our economies. We hope that uh, the protest across the five African countries will not just be looked uh, at in, in light of, uh, of politics, but then in addressing the social challenges that we experience on the continent to alleviate poverty, to alleviate exclusion, and to ensure that we work towards posterity of our continent. All right. Thank you so much. All right, now you're Thank watching you. Africa Update on Trust TV. Coming up after the break, activists embark on 862-kilometer work to advocate for a federation between Mali and Burkina Faso. Join us again for more. Thank you for staying with us. You're watching Africa Update on Trust TV. 
Now, 862 kilometers from Bamako to Ouagadougou by foot, over 150-hour journey. That's the cost for activists who are pushing for a federation between the two West African states of Mali and Burkina Faso. Holding the flags of both countries and the African Union, the group of about a dozen men and women walked single file over the weekend on the side of a road surrounded by scrubland near Houndé in western Burkina Faso. Today, we want to push our governments, our institutions and our peoples to move toward a federation because we believe that only a federation can be the global and definitive solution for Africa. Today, we believe that to secure the Sahel, we need very strong armies, but also that the states must harmonize their security policy and strategy with their development policy so that's why we, step by step, city by city, village by village, we communicate with the populations. On the federation which our two heads of state hold dearly, we have decided to work very closely on this between now and the holding of a mixed commission in Burkina Faso. We understand that there has already been a commission specifically set up at the foreign ministry level to address this question. And that's a wrap on Africa Update. For more, watch on our social media platforms and also on our YouTube live stream. Join us again next week for another time. I am Ayuba Ilea. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.